Hello and welcome back to When Sunday Comes, a podcast that aims to get into the heart of women's football and hosted by myself, Graham Falk. I'll be honest, I can't hide my excitement at this one. Today's guest is someone I've wanted to speak to for absolutely ages, so I'll just get straight to the introduction. Welcome to the show, West Ham and Scotland International, Lisa Evans. Lisa, how the devil are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm all good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the, on the show. Thanks for doing it. Honestly, I've wanted you on for a long, long while. We always start these podcasts with the same question and end it with the same one, so... It's just past seven o'clock on the 8th of January. How's your day been? What have you been up to? Been a chilled one. Uh, we obviously had our first week back in training, so just been grinding out. It's been tough after Christmas. It always is just to get back into the swing of things. But um, yeah, today was a down day and I've got tomorrow off as well, which has been lovely. Two days off doesn't happen very often. So just been chilling, really. The weather's been absolutely crap down here. As I can imagine, it's probably equally as bad up in Scotland, but... Yeah, no, chilling and getting back on to training on Tuesday. So, actually, what day is it today? Yeah, aye, Tuesday. So, back in training on Tuesday for our Man City game, first game back. So, looking forward to getting back to it. Yeah, no, without a doubt. And it's just, there's no fun training without with it, without the games. You need the games. So, and we're starting off a cracker with Man City. So, yeah, not a bad place to start, let's be honest. Um, I never, ever get to do this, but I'll try my best. We'll try and go through your entire career as best as we can, but we'll. We'll start with the most recent stuff. Obviously, at the time of speaking, we're, we're halfway through the WSL season, our four month in, which, whichever way you want to look at it. West Ham are fifth at the time of speaking, having a, a really good campaign so far. How much have you enjoyed the first four, like four months, first half of the season? Yeah, no, I have. I feel like it's flown in for a start. I feel like it's obviously been quite a transitional year for, for West Ham. We had um, Ollie, obviously, uh, didn't get kept on or wanted to leave, whatever, vice versa. But uh, like Paul Conch has come in, he's done a really good job. Um, and we've retained a lot of the squad that we had last season. I think we've obviously lost a few key players, but all in all, I think we're we're doing well. We're doing well with what we have. Uh, I think we're getting the best Paul managers to get the best out of everyone. Um, and yeah, like fifth is obviously good. We know it's it's going to be tough to stay there, and we're asking a lot to to maintain that position in the league. But I think we're more than more than capable of being up there. And like like I said, I think we're we are capable of taking points off anyone. Obviously, it's hard. The top three, four teams, Man City, Man U. Chelsea and Arsenal, it's always going to be difficult to take points off those teams. But I think we really fancy our chances against anyone. I think that's what's, that's what's good. Um, we work hard and, like I said, Conch manages, manages to get the best out of all of us, I think. Talking about, obviously, Paul Koncheski, um, you know, when it comes to him moving into the manager's role in the summer, when I've seen him on Sky Sports and, and after games, sort of assessing games, obviously I remember him playing for Liverpool and Fulham and stuff like that as a in, in the men's side of it. I've really enjoyed hearing him speak from a tactical perspective when he's on Sky Sports. I've I've really enjoyed hearing him sort of post match after the games as well. But um, how much have you enjoyed playing under him in the the first half of the season? No, I have. He's a really good like player manager. I think because he's he's been there, done it. Like he's so good at managing all of us, and I think he's almost just like got our backs. Yeah, I just feel like he's always somebody that you can go to and just have a chat with about anything. Like he's he's very open and uh, responsive person, and like I said, he gets the best out of everyone and. Uh, regardless of the tactics and everything else that goes along with it, I think he's just a really good person to be around and be on the training pitch with. Yeah, and he's had a, he's had a really good start because I think no one goes into the season saying, I hope we're fifth best, but I think we're all aware there's that your top sort of three, four teams are doing fantastically well. And after that, there's kind of an old mini table. And obviously at the moment, technically West Ham are top of that. And it's obviously his first sort of real job or first six months, should we say, at West Ham. He's done really, really well, but... From your own perspective, obviously you've just turned thirty, so you're still very young, but you've got bags of experience. And West Ham have got some. I knew that would make you laugh. Um, West Ham have got some great players coming through. Obviously, young ones. Lucy Parker just getting into the line Leicester squad not too long ago. Izzy Atkinson obviously came down from Celtic. Um, I assume these players will will look at you for advice, obviously because of the experience you've had and where you've played and what you've done. Have you enjoyed that role of it as well? If that's something that's kind of happened this season. I think so. Like it's never really a role that I've been too familiar with, obviously, because I think obviously Arsenal, Bayern Munich, I wasn't really that player. Like I wasn't really not not even like a experienced player, but obviously there was more experienced players in the squad. And I think now, even the conversations I had with Ollie last year and Conch this year, I think that is a role that I need to be more assertive in. I need to be um, more of an example for the girls and someone that they can bounce questions off of and be setting a good example for them and kind of walking the walk on the pitch for them to see what's what really um but like I said it's not really a role that I've been familiar with in my career although 
I do try and do all, always do, try and do the right things and be an example. But I mean, yeah, I've had amazing role models in in every club that I've been in. If it was in Germany, like I've had played with Mel Beringer and um, absolute class acts. Kim Little for me, probably the most professional um, athlete there is in the game. Like she's an absolute professional and day to day stuff. Um, so yeah, I've had I've had good leaders, and obviously now as well, Rachel Corsi at the national team. So also Kim Little NBA these days, isn't it? <laughs> Um, no, exactly, exactly. Not too bad at all. Um, it's funny. I, I was speaking to one of my guests the other day. Um, I'm obviously Monday to Friday. I'll, I'll write about WSL stuff. Work with Glasgow City on on the Sundays. I was kind of speaking about off air, and I've got to be honest. I'm really enjoying it at the minute. All the transfer chat. Um, because it feels. Oh, like so it. I'm the same. I love like I'm just nosy that way. I just love seeing like what all the gossip is. Like it's it's nice being in a position where you're just comfortable and you, you kind of you're set on where you're at and what you want to get out of the season and just kind of seeing what the movements are elsewhere. Um, hopefully West Ham will hopefully bring in a few. I don't know if we are, but um, yeah, it's just interesting seeing all the movement in the women's game and it's getting more and more year on year. So it's it's really interesting. You see the, the record fee now in England for um, Beth England. Really interesting. So yeah, I'm just sitting here with a cup of tea and reading all the Twitter pages, going through them all and getting all the goss really. Well, you're following me, so you're on the, you're on the right track if you want all the goss. <laughs> At least that's what I like to think. Um, in reference to that, I think, you know, I've I've worked in women's football for a while, but this this summer just gone and this window particularly, it really feels like you you can tell when you, you work as a journalist when the page views are flying up on women's transfer news. And um, that's because yeah. people are naturally caring so much more. And it's, you know, because of the Euros and the summer and the World Cup before that. But but as a player and um as someone who's been around the game for, you know, a, a good decade these days, have you noticed that, like, the media scrutiny between not just the game itself, but the, the transfers and things along that, like, contract renewals and things like that has changed massively over the past year? I think so, yeah. Without a doubt, you can see, obviously, like, the longevity of contracts now that are given. I think it was pretty much unheard of that people were getting offered, like, four-year deals and stuff like that, and for, obviously, a lot more money. And even just buying someone out of the contract, that wasn't really a thing that, that happened, really. And it was always... Even contracts, when I first started out at City, when I first signed my first uh, contract at Turbina Potsdam, I was like, contract? Like, it felt a bit like OTT and just something that we weren't really aware of being a thing, really. Um, so, yeah, now nah, it's it's crazy to see the development now and it's it's obviously going similar direction as, as to what the men's game is now. Obviously, it needs to go way further than it, it is right now, but um, it's, going, it's going in that direction, really. I think you can see that yeah. year on year. Feels like great steps. I think it's fab. I love a bit of transfer news. I think it's great that so many people have been invested in that now as well. It's fab and it's great for me for what I do as well, I guess. But always interesting to see the opposite side of it. But um, before we leave West Ham and this season uh, completely, obviously we're talking before the return of the WSL as we touched on before. So the yeah. last result that you had was obviously a big 2-0 derby win over Spurs. A derby win's always great, especially when yeah. it's in their own backyard. How big of a win, uh, how big of a win was that for you and the team? Yeah, no, it was one of those. It was a weird week because it was obviously freezing down here. We had like minus four, minus five. And I, I honestly don't think anyone thought the game was going to be on. Um, And it's funny because the, even the night before, I remember on the Saturday night, it was like the England-France game. And we were still chilling. Like I remember eating a bag of sweets and I thought, oh, do you know what, I'll just have these because I don't think the game's going to be on anyway. So I tucked into a bag of sweets and it wasn't until I messaged Claudia Walker who she's got a friend at Spurs and she asked her like, oh, what do you think chances that our game's going to be on? And she was like, yeah, no, no, we've got like heat lamps on the pitch. The game, the game is definitely going to be on. So I was like, oh God, right, put the sweets away. Like, yeah, so you had, it was a different preparation. It was quite relaxed because I think, although we did prepare totally for the game, we'd done all the tactics and all the set plays and stuff like that. We were all set up to play the game, but I think none of us really thought the game was going to go ahead. And then we, we turned up, pitch was amazing. Uh, they play at Leighton Orient. It's actually a really good ground. Um, and yeah, we done we done really well. We played really well and... Yeah, we had our Christmas night out after, so I'm glad the game went so well because the Christmas night out was even better. So, uh, yeah, no, it was a really good performance. I think probably our most stellar performance of the season so far. Um, I know that we adjusted tactics. We started off playing a back five and then we adjusted second half, playing a back four, and it, it really worked for us. We created a lot of chances and totally dominated the game. And I think 2-0, yeah, was was a fair score. And like I said, obviously, I know the girls get a bit gritty uh, with the, the Derby games against Spurs. Uh, Kate Longhurst being the prime example, as you can imagine. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, just it was a really good win and a good way to finish the season off. I know then the week after a Connie Cup game did get um cancelled, so it was a good way to to end the year really. 
talk about Kate Longhurst there. I think one of the uh, abiding memories of last season was her celebration against Spurs, wasn't it? That was oh, like on Sky Sports. Iconic. Great, great stuff. Yeah, Love no, it. it was class. Now, I'm going to take you back as far as I can before your career, all right? Um, I've lived in Scotland for the best part of just over a decade now, and I don't know. I've never met anyone who doesn't love football or have a team, if I'm honest. So, Where's your I've, accent? My accent's Sunderland originally. I'm originally a Sunderland boy. so I'm a, I would not have said that, because I can you know. honestly, sometimes I hear a twang of, like Irish in you as well. I've had that before, and you know what? I've never been to either island, Northern nor Republic. I don't know if it's, yeah, I don't know. Like It's probably just a mix of everything, eh? It's not a bad accent to have, to be fair, which is a nice accent, so I'll take it. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I've never known anyone not at least like football in Scotland. So, you know, I've watched a few podcasts before. I've listened to a few interviews with you before. I knew you were obsessed with football. But um, what was your earliest memory of, to, to coin a really cheesy phrase, sort of falling in love with football? Honestly, like, my mum, my dad, my sister, like the four of us have always just been like football daft. My sister, my older sister, Mary, she used to play football as well. We kind of just did every sport really when we were younger, but I think we both took a liking to football and we just used to play in the streets with our neighbours, surrounded by boys all in our street, used to play in the back garden. My dad got goals, like we just got really involved. And my mum and dad then, um, my dad had a major role at the football team. Like he was our coach with St. Johnson girls. Um, and I think just through that, like, that's, like, my earliest memories of football. I remember, like, my mum bringing the fruit at halftime, like, doing, like, the first aid bag, like, driving us up and down the country to games all over the gaff. If it was, like, Stonehaven or if it was in Whitburn, like, Paisley. We were just here, there and everywhere, up and down the country. And we just loved it. Like, that's – obviously, they built a connection as well within that. They were friends with all the, the girls' mums and dads. And it was just a proper community, like, a, a really good buzz Um. Yeah, and it was just something that we just loved doing. My dad loved doing the training. We loved it. My mum loved it. My sister loved it. And just all the connections you build through football, I think that's the most special thing about it. And the thing that I've really treasured along the way is meeting all these amazing people. And just, it's like best friends forever. I know that's proper cheesy and corny, but the girls that I play football with, it's, it's a different like bond. Honestly, it's like, yeah, I don't know how to say it. It's just... They just know you inside out. It's just it's different playing in a team sport together. You just create a different bond with with different people, and yeah, it's it's so special. I absolutely love it, and something that I'll have with me for always uh, from all the all the friendships I've made. Did you have a, a team you supported as a, a kid? Uh, well, to be fair, I used to go and watch St. Johnson a lot. Like obviously, because that's my local team. I'm from Perth, um, but obviously, I like Celtic as well. I had a lot of like Celtic tops and stuff when I was younger, and now I support Liverpool. So myself i could be wrong with this but when you talk about st johnson girls that's where you started did you start playing with lana cleland am i making that up oh no, yeah no i did that's correct that's right isn't it yeah um, no lana was it she actually went to school like 300 meters away from me and there was a few other girls like i don't you probably do you know you probably don't remember lauren mcmurchie no i thought glasgow say yeah i yeah so laws as well um yeah so i played laws like laws is one of my best best friends now like we're still so so tight and yeah i played with those girls it was just they were all in our team together and obviously still play with the national team Milana so it's all it's all good it's nice it was it was Lauren's birthday like two days ago or something am I right yeah nah, yeah but it was on the 6th of Jan there we go see no yeah. one you thought um thanks to Glasgow City um <laughs> what was girls football like in Scotland in those days because it, it wasn't that long ago but the way that things have moved forward so much especially even in you know we're talking about the game in the WSL earlier but the game in Scotland especially has moved on Massively, we've got three professional teams now, but what was girls football like when you were growing up and playing with St. Johnson girls? I mean, yeah, I wasn't really aware of much women's football. Obviously, like we didn't have, like we had to, like I said, we had to travel up and down the country for these games. It wasn't like how it is now that you've all got like localised leagues. I remember that there was another pair of team that came around. I think it was like Perth City or even Letham as well at the time. It was like there was another team in Perth, which was just like baffling to us that there was another girls football team out there because we'd been so used to traveling up and down the country for games but it's obviously progressed so much I feel like there's teams here there and everywhere now which is so good to see and honestly when I was growing up I, I just presumed that I would be playing men's football like I didn't there wasn't anything else for me because I, I wasn't aware of there being anything else I knew people had went to America and went overseas Alex Scott and Kelly Smith and I kind of thought that would be a path that I would go down because I just didn't think that football for women would be accessible in this country, unfortunately, at that time. So, um, 
yeah, it's just it's obviously so good to see the the growth that's happened, and like I said, hopefully it continues to to grow. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think everyone, especially myself, obviously knows that your your career began with Glasgow City originally in the youth ranks. Um, obviously, as you touched on before, you you were born in Perth, so it's not exactly next door. So, how did the journey at Glasgow City come about? How were you scouted? Who spotted you and stuff like that? Yeah, so Eddie, like Eddie Vlecky or Eddie Black, he's obviously a Perth Perth man. Like he's or he's from Dundee actually, but. My dad actually, I don't know how him and my dad ended up crossing paths, but um, we got chatting with him and we, I think me and Laws, like we started off going to like Nubra training because that's that was his team, Nubra. Um, and we did a couple of training sessions with them. And it's funny because me and Laws, they, my dad used to drag us to training and we hated it. It was on a Tuesday night and Leanne Ross at the time was there. She can tell you, uh, us two skinny runs turn up to training. Probably confident as anything, probably a bit arrogant, whatever young girls but hated it my dad used to drag us to the training sessions and I think obviously then we met Eddie Black and then Nubra folded and I think he took a lot of those players through with him to to Glasgow City at the time so the likes of like Jill Patterson and um kind of the golden oldies like uh, Lero as well um, and we obviously did a little bit of coaching as well with Eddie he did a little bit of coaching with St Johnson girls at the time we did a lot of individual stuff with Eddie a lot of like kind of training workshopy things like in the school holidays and stuff like that. And then him, my dad got quite close and then we all kind of ended up signing for City with the, the reserve team. Um, and we trained by Glasgow City every night and that was us really. The rest is history. The rest indeed is history. Um, I wanted to touch on obviously the time that you had at Glasgow City. I think everyone knows, um, this is going to sound a bit like a subtle brag because obviously people know I'm a City fan as well, but You've played for hugely successful clubs throughout your career. Um, Glasgow City being your first, and, and they're still the most successful club in Scotland. It'll take a long, long time for anyone to catch yeah, them. No, without a doubt, yeah. But how much did that help at a young age, having been at a club where there is pressure of league titles, and we all know what the standards are like at City. How much did that help you later in your career, having that at such a young age? Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I think it certainly showed us the ropes. And from such a young age, we had everything in place that you could think of like we had we were obviously I think the first team to train three four nights a week um obviously driving through there was a big car of us going from Stirling Uni at the time because we were all at um the university together but I think City were really the the team that paved the way for that for to increase the amount of training sessions to increase the intensity and Eddie had us doing all the stuff the video analysis the footage and stuff that we'd just never been accustomed to before and all the technical drills and he was obviously really keen on Barca. We used to watch so many clips of Barcelona and just try and, yeah, do what they were doing, obviously, to a different level. But, um, yeah, it was really, really professional. And it definitely gave me a, a kick up the arse in, in terms of my my professionalism, what was required to be at the top level. I think no matter how many years we go on in, in Scottish football, Glasgow City will be remembered as you know one of the pioneers of women's football because of really obvious reasons. Um, when you look back on your time at Glasgow City, obviously being the place where you, you began your career, where you sort of made your name, played Champions League football for the first time, um, what does Glasgow City as a club and, and your time at the club mean to you specifically in the context of your career? Obviously it's massive. I think Glasgow City kicked off my career. I think they gave me the opportunity to actually go and play professional football. And when the opportunity did come along with Turbina Potsdam, um, I, I couldn't really turn it down as, as sad as it was I was absolutely devastated to leave Glasgow City because it's all I'd ever known and it, it was perfect I had everything there I was playing every week I was scoring goals I played well I had best friends it was just I had everything there. I had my university that I gave up and um, so it was a really tough time and it was hard it was so hard to leave but I knew to get on the conveyor belt of playing professionally that I, I had to go and it, like I said it was so difficult because I love Glasgow City and it's honestly, it's it was such a good laugh. Like it was, the football was amazing, but obviously off the pitch as well. And it was just such a good bunch of girls, such a good bunch and such a good group of staff as well. We just had a really good group. I think a lot of you, obviously, as I know, still could stay in touch from those days <laughs> as well, which you can sort of tell. You were so closely knit. You obviously can still see each other, hang out with each other, see each other, Haley. You still see Haley and stuff like that. All those players still sort of stick together. But um Another reason you probably stick together, together an awful lot before we move into your time with um, Germany, it was obviously around this time you made your first appearance for Scotland um, alongside them, as some of those players I mentioned before, making your debut against Wales, if I remember correctly. It's probably a really obvious question, but it's interesting getting the your your view of it. 
what was the experience like of like having that Scotland shirt on for the first time, singing the national anthem for the first time, knowing that you'd represented your country and that no one, no matter what happened, could take that away from you? Yeah, obviously a massive, massive moment in my career. And I remember actually when Anna phoned me up to come away on my first camp, like I remember where and when I was. I remember playing far, far away. And she said like, oh, like we're going to be taking you away with us. And I thought, oh my God, this is this is crazy. Like it's just a pinch me moment really. And I remember just before me, I think Emma Mitchell, she had made her debut the camp before against France and France as well. So there was like a, a really big crowd of people and it was um, an amazing atmosphere in the stadium. And I thought, oh my God, this could be me soon. Like I could be pulling on a Scotland shirt and I did. And again, the Scotland girls, like I... I actually love those girls to death. Like, I love going away with the national team. It's just the most enjoyable time. The staff, the group that we have is so special. And it. it's so difficult when we, we don't qualify for the, the tournaments like the Euros and the World Cup. Like, it's such a disappointment because I think everyone, obviously, all the girls want to be playing at the highest level and be playing at World Cups and winning whatever. But I think it's just the time that we actually spend together, just the actual going away and being on those trips and having that time together is the most special thing about it. And yeah, from the first the first shirt I've pulled on to the last is it's just been such a journey and amazing for, for all the people that have been involved along the way. It's, it's just been so, so good. If that was Anna Sinyal, Shelley or even Pedro now. So nah, it's been it's been such a such a good time. Uh, while the girls and it's we've had our we've had our rides yeah it's been it's been amazing obviously I think when it comes to Scotland I do want to speak about Cup career as well but since we're on Scotland I was at the game and yes there was a disappointment against Ireland I, I, I get that I know people mention that but the game against Albania um, obviously I live right next door to Hamden and crowds gradually get further and further uh, bigger more vocal more invested more interested um, and that could probably be felt in some ways by the disappointment of the amount of fans up there for the island game. They mm-hmm. they really cared. They wanted to be there. Can you feel that support growing and growing and growing since maybe say the World Cup? Oh yeah, no, without a doubt. And I think especially when we were over in like I remember Nice, our first game against England, it was crazy the amount of fans. Like that is something that we will never forget as as players. Like it was so special to be away from home. Even the send off, obviously, we had it at Hamden Park before that. I think did we have. Was it 19,000 at the game? Yeah, just under like a couple of hundred under or something like yeah. that. Yeah. So just to have that send off as well to play Jamaica and just have that send off was, and again, like a pinch me moment. We didn't really get to play that that often at Hamden at the time. And then to go away, play in Nice and see all these fans traveling, traveling over in their drips and drabs, eh, drips and drabs in their, um, in their hundreds. Like it was, it was Tartan Army. And even just to see the family and friends just enjoy it, just, be part of it all it was so special and even in Holland as well to be honest at the Euros um, yeah both both just absolutely amazing have you ever read the book I'm guessing you have the book Arrival yeah no I have yeah great book um, yeah. because as people know I am English um, but I do I think I've seen the Scotland women's team probably more than most teams I've ever seen obviously because of where I live where I'm at the, the people that I know that within the team and I just thought the book Arrival was brilliant I thought it summed up that kind of era of Scottish women's football um, because a lot of stuff that focuses on women's football during that World Cup but Scottish women's football in particular and and I did want to chat about you touching that game against England I think officially you can correct me if I'm wrong on this but you've officially assisted Scotland's first ever goal at Women's World Cup Um, so looking back on the tournament and everything that went with it how much do you think that pushed the game forward sort of across Britain and can you also talk me through the emotions of like what came with that period in your life of those three games, that kind of couple of weeks that you had in in France and that World Cup? I mean, yeah, like it's it's hard because there was a lot of there was ups and downs of that tournament. I think everyone's kind of well aware on all the stuff that's kind of going on now. There was a lot a lot of beef as well, kind of if you want to say. I, maybe I shouldn't be saying that, but um, it was obviously the games were amazing, and I I think we'd all wish that we'd we'd qualified and we got out of the group and had one one more game. And I think just the way that we went out was obviously heartbreaking, just typical S- Scotland, really. I feel like that's how we always do it. We always, we're always there and then somehow we're not. But um, yeah, I think we just would have, I think if you ask any of the girls, I think we just wished that we had saw it over the line and, and got out of the group. I think that's that's what we would have really treasured going into the, into those games. And we knew it was going to be tough. We knew Japan and England were going to be a really, really tough ask. There's no doubt about that. 
Uh, we obviously came close in, in both the games. I, I, I do feel like we didn't perform to, to our best, considering the squad that we had. Um, I know there was kind of a few injuries as well and stuff like that, but I think the squad that we had, we should have performed better than we did. Um, but obviously, off the back of that, we saw um, it raised the profile so much, especially England and, and Scotland, obviously. It raised the profile so much, but yeah, I still think a lot of us are, are kicking ourselves at just the performance in, in the tournaments. I think, like I said, we our aim was to get out of the group and we didn't manage to do that. So it was it was disappointing, but obviously it was it was a really, really good trip and an amazing experience. Fast forward into like 2023 or 2022, the back end of it. I know the Ireland game was frustrating. Um, I get that. I won't touch on it too much. But prior to that, you know, most of the games, there's been a style that's been implemented, really good performances, and there's there's a world class player. There were two world class players. I mean, Caroline Ray is a joke at the moment. She scored again tonight from about forty yards. By the way, oh really? I'm not even surprised. It's just silly when you see it. You'll understand what I mean. Um, but it does feel like Scotland women's team, after maybe a slight lull at the change of managers, that slight period of not qualifying for um, obviously the, the the tournament, the Euros, Scotland are coming back a bit, take out the disappointment of that Ireland game. You can see that something's festering, something's getting better. Do you feel that within the camp? I think so, yeah, without a doubt. I definitely feel with Pedro and his staff, like they they are building something really, really good. I, I don't, like, obviously I worked with Pedro as well at, at Arsenal and he... He knows the stuff. He's not got the the portfolio that he's got off nothing. Like his and even his staff as well, Jose and um yeah, the rest of the staff. He's got an absolute class set of staff. And he just the way that he wants to play, the way that he sees the game, the details that he gives, he knows the stuff. The guy, there's no doubt about it. He's a top, top coach. Um and I think it was obviously just getting used to the style that he wanted to implement for all of us. It was kind of a shock to the system because it was very, very different, as you can expect, uh, to what we had been playing. Um, but I think as well he's kind of counteracted that. I think he knows what our strengths are, and we've kind of both sussed each other out. And no, I think it's amazing when we do go away for camps. Just the demands that are put on us, um, even off the pitch, that we obviously want to inspire the the next generation coming through. And like you said, like as an experience, and that's really important to inspire everyone that's coming through as well. We want to inspire the nation. When we go away to camp, we see that um, world class, as you mentioned, obviously the likes of Caroline Weir. Erin Cuthbert and the players that we've had in the past as well, Rachel Corsi and not even in the past Corsi is obviously still kicking about. Uh, Kim Little, uh, obviously. So yeah, um, it's just a shame. I don't really look, we've got the best out of of what we could have had um, in previous tournaments. Obviously, not qualified for the, the Euros and, and the, for the World Cup as well. So hopefully, um, in the next tournament, we can inspire, keep inspiring, and really, really push on and qualify for another major tournament because it would be it would be sad for this group not to get another chance. Yeah, absolutely agree. Um. Ryan, and back to your, your past and going back to Germany, because I kind of went on a total segue there, so do forgive me. But um, you moved to Turbine Potsdam after the spot due June. I think people know the Champions League game against City. Um, I've spoken to a few people on this podcast who've moved abroad at a young age, and I understand how good of a team they were at the time. Um, so that's incredibly tempting. But to move your entire life at like 20, 21, you might have been younger, actually. Um, that's really, really brave. What were the reasons that it felt right for you to make that move to that place at that time? <laughs> Honestly, none of the reasons felt right. It didn't feel right. Um, it's funny because I, I love telling the story. It's an absolute classic. But um, I remember me and my dad, we went on trial. We didn't. We kept it really hush-hush. I think obviously Eddie was aware that I was going and Monty and stuff to trial in, in January at the time. And I think I was over there for like three, four days with my dad. Well, four had to come back with it. Then I had a national team camp early January. And I remember going over there and we'd never really been to like the east side of east side of Germany. So it's obviously a lot different. Um Potsdam is an absolutely stunning place, by the way. Amazing place. Um, but me and my dad were put up in this kind of like rowing, like hot kind of thing. Like a, a like it was almost like a cottagey. I I don't even know what it was, but we had to walk to the training pitch. We walked to like a place called the Menza, and it was like a like a school cafeteria. So we got like our breakfast and lunch and dinner in there. It was quite depressing to say the least. Um, and then training three times a day. So I trained, I think the first session was like 9.30 till maybe 11. And then from one till two-ish. And then we had another session at night from five till seven. So it was a brutal, the schedule was brutal. And the weather was even more, <clears throat> the weather was even more brutal. I remember like coming out and 
seen some of the girls literally just wrapped up just eyes and nothing else like it was it was so cold I think it was minus 17 and I remember my dad just being so so cold and honestly it was I was so nervous and I didn't I didn't really feel comfortable nobody was really talking to me and I just I was I didn't feel myself and I didn't honestly I didn't have a good week I didn't play well I didn't really do myself justice in that trial and I thought oh, do you know what like I've not really done myself any justice I, I can't see them offering me anything and my dad was like do you know what it was an experience like we'll crack on and you're obviously really happy at City anyway, so if anything comes about, we'll we'll play it by you. But I don't think any of us expected any kind of offer to be to be put out there. Um, because even our partnership was just kind of like, okay, yep, yeah, yeah, we'll be in touch, kind of thing. It was very like not much communication whatsoever. And then I just got like a, an email one day, like in April, um, like with a contract offer for the next season, obviously to go out then in July, and that's when I kind of really shat myself <laughs> I was really scared um because I just thought like this is it like this is this is an opportunity that I need I have to take uh to go and play professionally just because it wasn't available I couldn't do it in Scotland and even in England at the time the game wasn't professional it was kind of players were getting paid to to play um games um playing for appearances so yeah, I knew that for a step for me as a person and as a player, I needed to go um, regardless of the, the week I had with my dad. And it's funny because the first two or three weeks, I thought, oh, God, it's quite tough. It was obviously it's way different and way easier going in, in summer. But um, by kind of like three, four weeks, I was like, do you know what? This is fine. Like, I've I've got it. I remember I used to Skype my mum and dad like every single day and I was missing them all the time. And yeah, by the third and fourth week, I wasn't really Skyping them as much. And I think they knew off that that I'd kind of made friends and settled in and there was a lot of American girls that I could kind of cling on to and we could speak English. And then kind of by six months to a year, I could understand pretty much everything, especially football wise. And then kind of a year to a year and a half, I could speak like fluently. So I think that just made everything easier for me. The type of person I am, I'm obviously really sociable and chatty Cathy. So um, it was really important for me to delve right in and, and speak the language. So once I grasped that, it was a piece of cake, really. The football just came naturally. Um, so, yeah. The German, they, I watched an interview of you doing, um, I think it was on Bayern Munich TV, speaking fluent German, and I tried to learn German, and I just couldn't do it. It was a bit it was a bit weird seeing you speak such fluent German with such a good German accent with no Scottish twanging whatsoever, and I was just oh, like, I, I didn't even fair, know. I, do think, I think some of the Scottish like dialect is a bit, it's quite harsh, so I do think it's easier for us to pick up German. Um, and I'd done French and Spanish at school, which was unfortunate, but yeah, I feel like... German is actually really similar similar to English, although people probably don't like to admit it. And there's not as wide a vocabulary. So once you kind of get the sounds and you can learn the vocab, then it's it's quite easy. The, the grammar and stuff's quite difficult. My grammar's not great, but I mean, people understand me, so it's, it's grand. When you were at uh, Turbine, Pot, uh, Turbine Potsdam, sorry, someone I find quite, really quite interesting is, I think I'm pronouncing his name correctly, but Bernd Schroeder, um, obviously a massive influence on, on German football and was at that club for a long time, I think, had like, founded it or had something to do with founding it. Yeah, yeah. What was your experience of working under him like? I love the guy. Like, honestly, he was he was my coach and he was horrible at times, like absolutely brutal and savage. But, like, I loved the man. I honestly loved the man. He was almost like a granddad sometimes. Like, I just... He just gave me so much energy and just I he could be listen, he the made the stuff that he made us do, some days I really resented him. I thought, oh my god, this guy can't believe what he's making us do this, like the running and sometimes there'd be some days that would be like, Are we getting our football boots on today? Nah, not today. Just take your running shoes. And that would be it. So you'd have your running shoes and be that'd be you on the running track for a session. So but I owe that guy so, so much. Um honestly, if I was to see him again today, I'd I'd love to sit down and chat with him and actually just appreciate for like everything that he'd done like he was obviously even in Potsdam he was like a celebrity everybody knew him and he was a massive massive guy tall and just at the stadium just the energy that he gave off such a like a class act and so funny looking back like the type of football that we used to we used to play it's obviously changed so much with the tactics and the video analysis and stuff like that but he got us all fit and he, he got us working really hard and it worked been uh Turbine apart somewhere obviously such a successful club for such a long time and fair play to the guy because he he started it all up and he picked those players and and got them trained trained up and training hard and yeah made it such a successful team out of it for so many years won Champions League trophies Bundesliga so yeah amazing guy didn't do too bad didn't do too bad at all um 
as it was, there's loads of stuff I want to touch on with that period of your life, but obviously um, there's only so many things I can ask. So we'll, we'll move to Bayern, obviously, where you moved in 2015. I think everyone knows Bayern, one of the biggest clubs in the world, let alone Europe. Um, you won your league in the, the first season there, I think, at the same time as the men won the league as well, which well. That was, that was amazing. They win it all the time, but we talked about success before and obviously what your first year was like at um, City and win the league and all that kind of stuff. But what was the first year like at Bayern to be at such a historic club and, and both sides winning their respective leagues? And I think you celebrated together, if you correct me if I'm well, wrong. Well, that was it. Like that was kind of the first club that I'd been at where it was more integrated in terms of men's football. Because obviously Glasgow and Tobina Potts are both standalone women's clubs. Um, and to be honest, we weren't really integrated that much with the men. Like we had our own separate training pitch and training ground we didn't train with them and we didn't have much affiliation with the men at all um we sometimes ate with them at the Sabino Strasse but other than that like we we didn't really see them at all there wasn't a lot of media I mean some media appointments and stuff like that we did with the men but um the party when we both won the league like the parties together were unbelievable it just literally pinched me moments like we'd be on top of the the um I can't remember what it's called in German it's the rat house yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know if it's just like a pub like a public hall, but the main kind of public hall place in um in Munich and just being on, on top of that and coming out with the likes of Ribery and Robin and then having a party with them at night, Lewandowski, Shabby Alonso, Tiago, like the team was just it was crazy. Vidal, like so many good players just rubbing shoulders the likes of them. Like it was it was actually unbelievable. So, so good. The best. I think that season, just after you made it all the way at the quarterfinals of the Champions League, and I'm looking through the, the run, I think it was 2016-17. If I recall correctly, you came up against Hibs in the round of 32. Yeah, no, um, we didn't remember Abby Harrison scoring a goal because she went off or not. Yeah. I still, I still slag it off for that. <laughs> um, obviously, you've grown up in Scotland, but you'd been away around sort of three, four years to that point, maybe four years, and you land back in Edinburgh for the night. What are your sort of memories of that? Because that must have been quite weird for you, because obviously the other girls in the team would have been just another Champions League game. For you, you're coming back to play against Hibs, who I think historically have been Glasgow City's rivals because of the success both clubs have had um, alongside each other. But what was that like for you? Oh, it was such a buzz. I still remember that night. Like I remember playing Easter Road. They obviously put us at the men's stadium. And even just being back in Edinburgh, it was so nice to be there and kind of show like all the Bayern girls like oh this is like this is where I'm from like this is Scotland it was pretty sick to do that and be there and we actually got a really crowd a good crowd that night it was a nice night I remember it being quite cold I remember playing up against Kirsty Smith who I'm now teammates with and just yeah just it was a really good night like I think I don't know what the score was if we won four or five now it was quite high I can't remember I think over yeah. the I think over the two legs it went in the double figures I think in over the two legs I could be wrong but I think it yeah was no a, I can't remember I'm sure the first leg was like four of maybe five now I can't remember but yeah no such a good night loved it like and so nice to be back and playing in front of Scotland playing in front of Scotland fans it's been a great draw for you that must be like the dream draw you just sitting there waiting for a Scottish team and then you get them bang and yeah no it was class it was class um. Obviously, with a club like Bayern, look, success is ingrained. And we've talked, we've used the word success in this about 40 times already, but it, it is like it is ingrained. And in some ways, it's expected in many ways at a club like Bayern. Maybe not just in Bayern specifically, but over the time you've been with other clubs, obviously, we'll, we'll move on to Arsenal soon. Um, how do you deal with those sort of pressures? Is that because you had it quite a young age? Do you kind of enjoy that? Is there certain ways you have to deal with it? Is it just taking it game by game? Like, how do you deal with pressures in football like that? It's funny because I think when you're younger, I just I I don't like I didn't I don't remember feeling that much pressure. I do remember feeling nervous, but I just was so confident of my own ability that like I just backed myself. And now I blooming and wish I had half that confidence that I used to have, honestly. Um yeah, no, nah, I think obviously I think playing professional like football, playing professional any sport, you you crave those pressure moments. You wanna perform um in the big stages and you wanna do well and even in training stuff, you want to be put under pressure. You want to be out of your comfort zone and that's the only way you get better. So I think, yeah, it's obviously part and parcel of the game, isn't it? To be able to perform under pressure and whether or not you can do it is a different story. Ask me after the City game. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's what you love doing, isn't it? You did move on to another really successful club in Arsenal. Um who have, in in my opinion anyway, huge, huge, have been huge advocates of the women's game for ages and ages, arguably produced some of the greats. And I mean, I'll name a couple, but Kelly Smith, Alex Scott, Rachel Yankee, then we'll move on to Jordan Nobbs, Leah Williamson and, and modern day. Um, 
What were your initial impressions when you obviously first went to Arsenal? I understand why you would have went there, but what were your initial impressions when you arrived? Um, yeah, like I was just happy to be back in in England. I just think there was a it was a league that just excited me. That was more than anything. It wasn't necessarily Arsenal. I just wanted to be back in the league and be yeah be amongst it. And I had friends obviously that played the likes of Emma Mitchell and Kim Little. They're two of my best friends in football, and to be able to train with them day in day out and playing the same team was really special and even the friends that I made along the way Arsenal was just it was it was the best time in my football career I, I loved the girls I loved the team Um, obviously it was short lived under Pedro he part we parted ways obviously really early doors he was the one that brought me into Arsenal so I'm obviously forever grateful for that giving me the opportunity to play back in England but then obviously then Joe Montemuro came in and he absolutely smashed it. We won the league with him, like a great guy, a great coach, like intelligent, like no other, like football intelligence. He was so good. Um, So yeah, I've been really lucky in that respect to have played under some amazing managers and to be training with the likes of the girls that I said and the likes of the girls that you mentioned um, has been really special. And it was honestly Arsenal, was, it was such a good time in my career. I loved every minute of it. I think it's funny when you look back on um, women's football, you you know, you can look at like heroes now and, and the WSLs and Sky Sports and stuff all the time. But I feel like if you go back even just 10 years and then 20 years, all of the best, most famous players have either been through Arsenal or came from Arsenal. And it feels like they've been looked after as a women's team for a long, long time. I know not every club has had that. I get that. Um, and I know that it's getting more to where they are like that. But when you were at Arsenal, did you feel every bit as much as valued as as the men's team? Because that's definitely the vibe it gives off that it's always been. I think nowadays, decades. yeah, I think nowadays you can really see that. Like, I think this is the first season though that Arsenal and the girls probably feel like that. Like they probably feel like they're getting equal opportunities mm-hmm. as the men are, which I don't think they could have said even last season. I don't think that was the case. So obviously, when I was there, it was amazing. Like we had everything in place to to be the best that we could have been but there was obviously obviously certain drawbacks and limitations as well to that and obviously the priority like prioritizing the the kind of academies and and the men's first team which has now changed I know that but obviously Arsenal kind of they they are the pioneers and they pave the way for other teams to to look at what they're doing which is really important for the league obviously like so West Ham we try and emulate everything that Arsenal are doing but there's obviously there's scope with that. It's obviously financially a lot more restrictive than the likes of what Arsenal's got, Man City, Chelsea. So I think obviously all the other teams need to, to play catch up in that respect. And it's up to the, the teams and um, obviously the boards and stuff to try and invest more money and, and really push the women's game in the right direction. But it's going to take time. And like I said, Arsenal's took a lot of time to get to where it's at. And they are they are paving the way. There's no doubt about that in England right now for for women's football and they're really showing how to do it class act playing at the Emirates all the time really pushing the crowds um, the social media stuff's amazing the team's great the coaching the level of staff like the quality of staff it's the quality of players it's just they, they have everything to to be to be the, one of the best teams in the world and I think you can see that from their, their Champions League season so far that they should be one of the best teams in the world. I know that they've been disappointed in the past with the the Champions League runs that they've had, but for me, the likes of Chelsea and and Arsenal, Man City, they they should be one in the Champions League soon because they're putting so much into it. I can't see them now not getting anything anything back from from what they've what they've put in. And now you see the Lionesses as well. Obviously, when in the Euros, you can see that it's starting to to reward the girls and and the FA as well. So. Talking of, I think, obviously, a lot of the time, especially recently, you talk about all the good things that are happening in, in women's football. And I only work in it. I don't play in it. I don't get coaching and all that kind of stuff. So I think it's difficult for me to make a real judgment of what I think still needs to be done. And I think I, I certainly don't want that conversation to be lost. That's the one thing I do know. So whilst there's been loads of positives, loads of more things that are becoming equal or at least getting closer to it, from your perspective, and and obviously you playing as a professional and have been for you know a number of years now, a number of seasons. What do you think are the most important things that need to be done to push it on further forward? What do you think the things that are maybe being missed out on and need to be concentrated on? I think kind of just like I mentioned, I think obviously the top teams like Chelsea and Arsenal are kind of paving the way, and I think it's really important that the other teams around that follow suit. They they need to follow suit, otherwise they're going to get left behind very quickly. Um, as you already mentioned, there is kind of a top three four that kind of just get away from everyone else. And it's important that 
the five to the ten can then keep up can keep up and keep progressing the game because that's important. We can't just stand still. We need to be really progressive in that. And I think from the lower down teams like the likes of West Ham, Spurs, Brightons, I think you can see the investment is is getting made. But I think it's important to continue to do so to to make sure that the gap isn't as big. We need to really try and all the teams around need to try and bridge the gap. And if whether that's yeah, obviously putting more money in, getting better players, getting better, getting better quality of staff, getting more staff. I know that a lot of teams have shortages of staff members, which obviously isn't great. The lack of lack of medical, lack of doctors, physios. Um so yeah, I think all that stuff needs to be in place for that for for it to be better. I know that we need better crowds, but we need to have things in place that the the players can perform and be available every week. You, you've seen the amount of injuries now in, in the league. It's 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 ridiculous. It's it's a lot, a lot, a lot of injuries. And there's obviously a lot of onus on the players to take responsibility of obviously their bodies and look after themselves, but they need the proper infrastructure at the clubs at all levels for for it to be yeah, to to be the best you can be and to to be available to play. Um so yeah, obviously I think that's really important for the clubs just to have the best infrastructure. It's not really about getting money and getting paid necessarily the the highest amounts that you need to get paid. It's literally having the, the proper infrastructure and the the stuff that you need to be a professional athlete, whether, like I said, whether that's physios or whether that's a game ready or whether that's an ice bath. Like it's just having those things, like the fundamental things to to make you perform, first and foremost, I think needs to be in place at, at all clubs. And it's I know it's for a fact it's not it's not there yet. Yeah. Um talking of your time at Arsenal, obviously for a lot of your career you played in specific positions, then you got to Arsenal and all of a sudden you played everywhere. Um, almost in every position. Now I think a lot of the time you can discuss not having a position on a regular basis as can be seen as quite a negative, but there's got to be positives to it. So obviously, while it can be hard for you playing left back, left wing, up front, right back, left back, wherever it may be, in numerous different positions, it can be difficult. But what are the benefits of being so flexible in all those positions? And what kind of things do you learn from positions that you hadn't maybe played before? Yeah, well, I think first and foremost, it was kind of Joe Monomuro. I remember when he first came in, um, he was like, he said to me from the get go, like, listen, I'm considering you as a right back. Like I really want to try and convert you into a right back. And I thought, what the what the f? Like no chance. Um, but the more obviously it got on, the more I thought, yeah, okay, this is quite cool. Like modern day, modern day fullback, probably the best position in the game. To be honest with you, it's it's fun. You're on the ball all the time. You can control games and you can get forward. So I was like, there, yeah, this is fun. And I think you just you learn a lot about yourself yourself. But I think that's what Joe done so well. I think in every position he made it very clear what your role was. And I, I think every every person that played under Joe at that time knew exactly what was needed and what Joe wanted from them, what was expected. So it wasn't a case of I'm, I'm playing fullback. I don't really know what the eight or the ten is meant to be doing. I think he was very set in stone on what he wanted and what was required for every position, which we were all very aware of. So it wasn't it didn't it wasn't really a big deal of slotting into different positions from that from that respect. And to be honest, I was kind of only going between fullback and, and winger. So um it was pretty straightforward. There's not actually too much difference in those positions. We didn't really change formation very much. It was always kind of four three three, or a version of that. And I obviously had great players playing around me. Um, I had Lee Williamson obviously to the to the left of me most of the time. Um, and then I had Kim Little in midfield, Jordan. Um, and then Beth made in front, or Daniela van der Donk, whoever Viv, like just so many top players around me. Just pretty much at Arsenal, I just thought. Do you know what? Get the ball to someone that's going to make something happen, whether that be Kim or whether it be Viv, like get them on the ball and something will happen. And it usually did. So um yeah, it wasn't really so much about me playing playing as a fullback or being versatile or being this or that. It was literally to get the ball to those girls and they'll make something happen. Looking at obviously your time with Arsenal, I kind of sat for ages of all the things you achieved with Arsenal, all the big moments. I thought, you know what, bugger it. There's no, I'm never going to get through all of it. So there's so many good times, so many good memories I could speak about with Arsenal, the hat rate against Spurs, winning WSL, all that kind of stuff. But what was your personal favourite memory from your time at Arsenal? Winning league, no doubt about it. I remember that whole week. It was the same like same week my sister got married, actually. And I just remember like at the time just going away. And it was actually me, Viv and uh, Emma. We got allowed to 
go to my sister's wedding. We'd we'd won the league uh, on the Saturday, I think, in Brighton playing at the Amex. And obviously, like back in the day, I say back in the day, or was even two or three years ago, that didn't happen very often. It wasn't a fact that you just turned up and you were playing at the men's stadium. So to be playing at the Amex for one and a nice summer's day, winning the game, winning the league. I remember then that night we had the PFA Awards, Fev won uh, the Player of the Year. We had our party. Everyone was drunk and it was just, it was such a good day. Such a good, good, good day. Um, getting the trophy and then, actually we didn't get the trophy that day. We just won the league that day. And then, like I said, I had my sister's wedding that week in Tenerife, which unfortunately we were out of the FA Cup because it was the FA Cup the following weekend, which then Joe had said, you know what, girl, I was like, come but you can go away the Monday to Friday. She was getting married in Tenerife. So we went, jetted off to Tenerife and came back. And we then played um, Man City, I think, the following week. Um, and then we got the title and stuff like that. And I remember Emma Mitchell scoring a screamer that day against Man City. And it just, it just, it was a great time. Those two, three weeks were, yeah, just so good. Probably, definitely, I think a career highlight. Obviously, like I said, the, being on, being on the Rat House and being with Byron was very special. But I think our son was even more special. Just being able to do it with friends and family around me. And like I said, some of the best friends that I'd ever made in football, Emma Mitchell and, and Kim and, all the other girls, Kate McCabe, like it was just, we had such a good team and it was just, it was just a great vibe and a great time, really good time. I think when you look at your time at Arsenal, obviously, and this is just from an outside looking in, but I think you've pretty much confirmed it there, obviously the players, the team, the bond that you had with the fans, massive. Um, you can see what it's like online and stuff like that now when you, you mention a certain player's name and the fans just react to it and it's just like, it's just a bond there. I know sometimes it's not always your own decision, um, but did it was it still hard to leave Arsenal? Oh yeah, no, without a doubt, yeah. And I think to be honest, like it, it was actually Claire Wheatley that I came to me. It was kind of when Jonas was just coming in, and I thought I was really excited because I thought it's a new prospect. I wasn't really playing that much anymore towards the end of the season. A new prospect, a new time to, to go back to the drawing board and kind of sort my shit out and be better and do better and be there for the team and be playing, put myself in a good position to be playing again. And unfortunately, it wasn't meant. It wasn't meant to happen. Claire had just said that she was looking at options for me to go out on loan and if that would be okay with me because obviously I could have dug my heels and said you know what yeah I'll stay I want to stick it out but I think when you don't feel the value or you see potentially that you could be of better value somewhere else and I think that's an opportunity that you need to take and I, I, I love my tenant at West Ham it was so good I love being on loan and I really felt the love from like teammates and coaching staff and it was a good year that we had and that's why I decided to stay because I just I like the club and I feel like it's it's going in the right direction obviously we need a lot more there needs to be a lot more that needs done like I said for a lot of teams in the league but it was a special place and uh, great to be a part of Final two questions always remain the same apparently these are the hardest questions to ask so forgive me in advance I'll give you the penultimate one first who's the toughest opponent you've ever come up against and why? Um, I'd say Nadine Kessler in Germany in Wolfsburg I think I've never seen a, t- a game won single-handedly by any player. And I think when we played, when we, I think I was in, when I played for Potsdam, we played uh, Wolfsburg in the semi-finals of the Champions League. And we started the game off really well. And I thought, yep, here we go. Like it was the second second leg. I think we drew 0-0 at home or 1-1. Um, and we played them at home in the men's stadium, the Wolfsburg men's stadium. And she just totally dominated the game, like, took us apart single-handedly and I remember that really stuck stuck in my mind how, how good she was. And then final question. There's a couple of rules to it but not too many. Your ultimate five-a-side team but it has to be players that you've played with. It can or it cannot include yourself. That doesn't really matter. It's up to you. And you can or you cannot include a goalkeeper. You can go rush goalkeeper. You can play a goalkeeper. No yeah, formation. Sack the goalie. Sack the goalie. I'm definitely not picking a goalie. I do. I've played by a lot of good goalies. The listener is probably the best one, but she's not. She's not making the team. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, I'd probably say Marin Mielder. Um, she's at Chelsea now. I don't think we probably see the best of her now. I think she's had a lot of injury injuries. She's had her struggles, but when I played with her at Tobina Potsdam, she was the real deal. She was so so good week in week out. Any position that you asked her to play, whether that be number six, right back, centre back, she was. She was always quality and I rated Marin so much. She got stuck in and just really good footballer and a really good person as well. So, yeah, I'd definitely say Marin Mielder. Um, I have to say Kim Little because she is, like, she's just phenomenal. Honestly, I don't think you know, I don't think people appreciate how good Kim is. And even now, like, I know she's she's older, but 
she's still so so good and I think she's the reason where Arsenal are where mm-hmm. they are she's she's absolutely a class act in any position again um, she just dominates and she just she quietly just goes about her business doesn't necessarily get all the plaudits but absolute class act just yeah like I said week day in day out she's just she's just a total professional and she's a great friend as well so yeah I need to say Kim um, I can't think who else I've played with there's a lot of good ones yeah god so many I mean at Potsdam there were so many as well um, at Potsdam, I played with uh, Yuki Ogimi. She was she was up there. She was very very good. She's now I think I don't know if she's Nagasato again or I think she's been remarried. But at the time, I remember coming in and thinking this girl is phenomenal. She used to score so many goals and just she was a proper technician, just so so good. Um, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, Arsenal. I'd probably say Viv to be honest with you. Like Viv is probably the best footballer that I've seen maybe biasly saying that but she is on her day she can be like no other um it's whether or not she can be bothered sometimes but um I think on her day like Viv could easily be the best player in the world I think she she could eventually be there obviously she's got a bad injury now but um nah she she was a class act and I think you can see that from her goals whether she's playing as a nine or the ten I do I'm going to be honest I prefer her as a nine but mm-hmm. um yeah, she's she's just such good footballer, left and right foot. And like I said, she's her attitude sometimes needs a kick up the arse. But um nah, she's a top quality player, she really is. And she can she can win your game at the drop of a drop of a six sixpence. So how many have I got there? How many is that? Oh. And you haven't included yourself yet? No, yeah, I'm not going on my team, no chance. You're the first <laughs> person to ever do that. Everyone else has chosen themselves. Nah, no chance. Um I think it's tough, isn't it? It's a tougher question than you think. Yeah, no, it is. Uh, so yeah, either who I've played with or played against. Played only played with. Oh, played with. Yeah, okay, that's harder. Uh, Kaz. Kaz is up there. Yeah, she is up there. She's up there. I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah, Kaz, I, I did like playing with Sarah Debritz as well. At mm-hmm. I did like playing with, uh, yeah, and, and Mel Beringer as well. She's obviously a legend, but I'll say Sarah. Um, I really love playing with Sarah Debritz. It was always kind of me and her on the wings at Bayern. And yeah, she was a great girl as well and technical genius. I know, again, she's had a lot of injuries uh, since, since her move to Lyon, but um, I'm sure she'll kick on now. But yeah, she's a top player. Not a bad five-a-side team, let's be honest. Um, Lisa, that was lovely. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it. Um, I hope you had fun doing it, most importantly, because I'm always going to have fun. I'm the one hosting it, but I hope you had fun. That's the most important thing. Yeah, no, it was fab. Thanks for having me, Graham. No problem. 